The thing is that there can be in mathematics, particularly in number theory, there can be theorems about numbers that are tremendously hard to prove. And maybe when you've proved them, you don't feel you've got any insight as to why they're true. Uh, I mean, in fact, asking why, you know, although I keep on asking why, I don't understand what it means to ask why. And I don't understand what would count as an answer to that question. That's the voice of John Horton Conway. He died this week at the age of 82. He wasn't just one of the great mathematicians of his generation, he was also one of the great characters. I interviewed Conway for a series of number file videos back in 2014. You'll hear a few clips from those videos today, including a few that weren't used originally, playing them for the first time here. I'll also be speaking to other people about their thoughts on Conway. First, it's the woman who wrote the book on him, quite literally. Siobhan Roberts was Conway's biographer. So I first met him when I was writing my biography of Coxeter. So that would have been 2003. I tracked him down at a math camp that he was at for a couple of weeks. Conway was at this math camp. Yeah. So that was 2003. And then, you know, when you first meet Conway and being a writer, I kind of knew immediately, well, here's a fantastic subject for a book. So I think, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's when I started collecting Conway anecdotes. And then when the Coxer book came out in 2006, then I proposed it to John that I could write his biography. And initially he said no, but then when he suffered his first stroke, he sort of, you know, felt his own mortality. And um, soon after that, he reconsidered. So I guess I started in in earnest, maybe in 2007. And then the book came out in 2015. So all in all, I've been kind of on his on his trail for, you know, I was on his trail for more than more than 10 years, which is a long time. So every day I would walk across town and go and sit with Conway in his alcove at Fine Hall in the math department. Yeah. And yeah, there were countless, countless visits. And he was supremely generous with his time. He was at once a biographer's dream come true and worst nightmare because he just loves talking so much but he is a great storyteller so you know it was this this wonderful treasure of uh of information but you know there were pros and cons and you know he was kind of as i came to discover in the fact checking process when i would at the end go back and and want to nail down certain details hmm. you know he seemed almost congenitally incapable of answering a yes or no question so I would have some, you know, very specific question, you know, yes or no. And he would be like, well, have I ever told you the story of how I came to discover surreal numbers? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, John, I've already heard that story a number of times. I did only meet him once. Even from that one meeting, I can tell he would be a really hard guy to pin down. I imagine at times he would have treated you like a, like a, like a, he was a cat with a mouse and would enjoy messing with you. Yeah. I mean, he did like to, to sort of string people along. And there were a couple of times where he told me stories that turned out not to be true. Um, <laughs> you know, so there were some counterfactuals and some misdirection there. And, yeah. you know, I'd have to tri triangulate a truth, if not the truth. <laughs> it was fun, but it could be, it could be infuriating. He was a giant in a lot of different ways. He did very important central mathematics. He did any amount of recreational mathematics. He was also a stuntman in various respects. Quite a remarkable character. David Eisenbud's director of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California. Oh, he attracted plenty of attention. That was, you know, he famously said that when he went to Cambridge for university, he decided to transfer from being an introvert to an extrovert. But his his notion of being an extrovert was to do stunts. So, you know, he could roll his tongue in, in more ways than you're supposed to be able to do. <laughs> or he could calculate the uh, day of the week of a given date very, you know, within two seconds. He loved that kind of thing and was extremely good at it, too. I mean, very talented person in a lot of different ways. But he, he wanted to stand out, and that was how he had figured out to do so, I think. Why did you become a mathematician? Why didn't you become a runner or a bricklayer? I became a mathematician 
in some sense, before the age of four. So uh, doesn't that excuse me from answering the question why? Uh, you know, it's more than 70 years ago. Uh, I did go through a period when I was at high school in England of possibly being more of a scientist of a physicist or something. But mathematics always seemed to be it somehow. Here's, here's the answer, really. There are some things, I call them parochial. Well, let's say parochial really means depending on where you live. You know, I live in the parish of somewhere. I'm going back to, you know, the 16th or 17th century. You know, I live in the parish of so-and-so. And -so there, parochial matters are just relevant to people who live in this particular little district, you know. And I'm not really terribly interested in, in parochial things. They're just local. And if you move to another parish in the same county, they're not, you know, you have a different uh, set of values and so on. In a larger sense, if I'm interested in a sort of British history, well, American history is different. Uh, and so British history is parochial, and so is American history, you know. And then you can go up to world history and geography. They're still parochial. And when finally we meet some people, I'll call the Martians, but they're not really Martians, uh, who've been educated in a totally different way and maybe discovered fantastically interesting things, then what they're saying is less parochial. With mathematics... I suspect that these people I'm calling Martians, perhaps aliens would be a better name, would still be interested in mathematics. Uh, so it was the most non-parochial subject. I used to think like that at the age of 14, maybe. That was my reason for really concentrating on mathematics, I suppose. At least that was my rationalisation of why I thought about mathematics. And in a way, it still is. You know, am I interested in the history of the Ottoman Empire? Well, there's possibly a good reason to be interested in it if I'm Turkish, which I'm not, you know. Or if I'm Greek, because Greek was subjected to Ottoman rule. No, I'm not. Really, well, I actually am interested. I like to think in everything. But uh, I'm less interested in those than in the things which will be of interest to the aliens when they come to visit us. Someone who's dying in the street of starvation doesn't care about the symmetry of objects in 24-dimensional space. True. Like, that, nothing matters less. I agree. Listen, I'm not, I'm not going to go up to that person, kneel down and try and interest him in 24-dimensional space, you know. Uh, I might very well uh, try and produce some food or some uh, warmth or some lodging and so on. I'm not entirely without human feeling, although I think human feelings are parochial. <laughs> I mean, I came to be very fond of him, which is kind of a funny thing as a journalist. You know, you're supposed to keep your distance from your subject. But since I did spend so much time with him, you know, I did find him to be a very endearing fellow. You know, mm -hmm. he was a vulnerable soul in a lot of ways, yeah. but at once, you know, an egomaniac. As he used to say, you know, modesty is my only vice. If I weren't so modest, I'd be perfect. <laughs> and yeah, he just had this, you know, obviously this massive curiosity. I think he would write Martin Gardner letters in the 60s and 70s telling him about all his, you know, games and things that he was inventing and what he was thinking about. And one time Martin wrote back and, you know, commented on the kaleidoscopic profusion of ideas that Conway had sent him. So he was just, you know, he had this treasure trove of of things going on in his brain and it was such a joy to sort of try and tap that and and understand it even you know in a very superficial way as far as I was concerned I think. Well he was rather different from the average mathematician. Colin Mulcahy is a mathematician at Spelman College. He's also vice president of the Gathering for Gardner. He didn't have airs of graces. He wasn't particularly impressed by credentials. He was interested in ideas. Hmm. He would talk to anybody on the street. And in fact, uh, he was one of those people whom people sometimes thought was a man on the street. Yeah. He could be mista mistaken for a hobo in later life because, uh, you know, he didn't wear a suit uh, or comb his hair very often. 
But he just was an infectious um, man with, with a tremendous passion and effectiveness for communicating and getting people interested in mathematics. So, you know, he, I mean, anybody who ever went to a talk would never forget it. And I had the good fortune to see him probably a dozen times in the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, just amazing, amazing Kai. I think he really valued simplicity. Um, you know, mathematicians talk about elegance and and beauty and simplicity. And so he really did always want the simplest, clearest uh, explanation, whether it be in words or in uh, a theorem. You know, that was another funny thing about writing the book. He was he, he read parts of it towards the end. And so he was constantly, you know, questioning my word choice. Yeah. Um, so I think he just had, you know, he just had really fine taste and in, in all things intellectual and sort of that quest for knowledge and wanting to to know how things work and how the world works and just trying to find these these little moments that spark your spark your brain and then get to the bottom of things. So what was John Conway like in person then if you would have a coffee with him or when he wasn't like, you know, playing the room? He was never not playing the room. He was a he was a born performer and it was absolutely charming to be with him. I mean if you like that kind of thing, and I do, um, you know, it was a laugh a minute. It was kind of a new trick, a new thing that he did or told you or could do all the time. Let's see, when we invited him to come and give a talk, you know, we have these museum dinners, rather formal dinners, fancy catering. This particular one was at Will Hurst's offices in a high-rise building in San Francisco, and um, we had nice cocktails, and there was music, and then we went down to hear Conway talk. And Conway had come wearing a tie, which was extremely unusual for Conway, and, uh, but he saw that Will Hurst was not wearing a tie. I, of course, I was wearing a tie, but Will Hurst was not wearing a tie. And uh, so as he began his talk, he commented on this, and he said, since Will was not wearing a tie, he wasn't going to either. And, but that wasn't, you know, that's not enough for Conway. So he, he took off his tie while he was standing at the podium and threw it on the floor and jumped up and down on it. So yeah. that, that was the sort of way Conway would do things. He had a card trick, uh, which was his own extension of a classic principle, and he did it with a rigged deck. So he would set up the entire deck, but the deck could be shuffled once, could be given one so-called Gilbert shuffle, where you deal off some into a pile there by reversing their order. Mm. So he had a setup where he could set up the deck, uh, take it out, and do a few false shuffles, and then do this genuine shuffle and convince people the deck was very randomized. And then he would do trick after trick. He had a little sequence um, with his own kind of slight, you know, his own slant on it. And uh, it was very entertaining. So having seen him do it a few times, I begged him to tell me what was going on because I was starting to get interested in card tricks myself. This would have been the late 90s, I guess. And he did actually give me the inside secret. And like all inside secrets, once you hear it, you go, oh, is that all there is to it? But of course, when you don't know that, it's quite an impressive trick. Yeah. But the fun part was I would then... When I would meet him at conferences, I'd always have the deck ready in the Conway order. Yeah, and um, I would I would give it to I you know he would he would spot me and once once he understood he would um, he would say to somebody oh does anybody have a deck of cards by any chance <laughs> and I'd say oh I have one here John I think yeah and he'd go, oh, thank you very much and you take it from me and off he go because he knew I had set it up in the right order. Physicist Tony Padilla's a regular on number five and like John Conway was born in Liverpool and went on to study at Cambridge. He's a bit of an inspiration, really, because, of course, you know, he's, he's a, a mathematician, one of the world's greatest mathematicians, and he just happens to come from the, the same city of me, as me, you know. So he's the boy from Liverpool who went on to be, be one of the world's greatest uh, mathematicians. And it's natural that, for me, that makes him an inspiration. It also made me, always made me feel a little bit inadequate, to be honest. Um, you know, you think you come from the same place. You think maybe you've got the same similar starts in life, even though he's obviously quite a bit older than me. Uh, and he's just gone on to do sort of things that I could only dream of. He's kind of like lived the you know, life, gone from Liverpool to Cambridge. And then, and then he's just done everything that I've tried to do in my career, but he's just done it so much better. <laughs> it's, uh... Do Scousers know who he is? Like, is he identified as a famous Scouser? No, I don't think so. So we're talking about, you know, one of the world's greatest mathematicians here, and he, and he comes from, from our city. 
we're not just talking about some some ordinary mathematician we're talking about an absolute great here yeah. and i think you know we should be super proud of him in the way that we're proud of of um of our musicians and, and our footballers have you ever dipped into his actual mathematics or is it not really something that's crossed your path so obviously the whole monstrous moonshine thing is course related to string theory um so that's that's something where you know you hear the name crop up and it, but i'll tell you where, where, where i've really sort of started to you know, come across it more and more. And obviously we make a lot of videos, Brady, on, on big numbers. Hmm. And, I, and I think Conway, his name crops up again and again. And when I'm sort of doing a bit of digging on these sorts of things, you know, the the arrow notation, Conway arrow notation, for example, um, hmm. is something that, that we haven't really discussed, but but I keep seeing and thinking, oh, maybe that's something that we should do a bit more on. I don't know if you've actually discussed it with him. Uh, but, you know, it's just seeing his name, his name keeps cropping up in that area. And I was also, you know, reading some stuff up about symmetries and whatnot and um, learning about his magic theorem. So you just, I, I think a lot in the in, on the recreational side of maths is where I would sort of perhaps... Uh, see see more of him uh, you know what you know, doing the things that, that we do together you obviously spend loads of time with lots of mathematicians do you have any idea what it was about him that made him different to the others well i think he he wasn't interested in what was fashionable so he really did go his own way he wasn't governed by you know kind of ordinary propriety hmm. and so that gave him a certain freedom maybe in his, you know, I call it his promiscuity of curiosity. He would, he really, at some point, you know, he had this period in his life where he was quite down and, and wasn't um, happy with how he was progressing as a mathematician. And then he had his, his Annus Mirabilis when he invented the game of life and discovered surreal numbers and his Conway constellation of, of groups. And then after that, he really decided not to worry what anybody else thought. And he would just pursue whatever interested him and, and, and go his own way. And I think, I think that's somewhat unique. I have never really been worried about whether something was trivial or not. Well, no, that's not true. I was worried. You know, in my early 20s, let's say, people always thought that uh, I would you know, be a great mathematician and be good at various things and so on. And in my late 20s, I hadn't achieved any of the things that people were predicting. And so I call it my black period. I started to wonder, you know, whether it was all nonsense, whether I was not a good mathematician after all and so on. And then I made a certain discovery and um, was shot into international prominence as a mathematician. When you become a prominent mathematician in that sense, it doesn't mean that many people know your name. It means that many mathematicians know your name. And there aren't many mathematicians in the world anyway, you know, so it doesn't count very much. But it suddenly released me from feeling that I had to live up to my promise. I had lived up to my promise. I remember I, I was lecturing on it very, in various mathematical capitals uh, I lectured in Paris, in Göttingen, and then flew to New York, gave a 20-minute talk and flew back again. That's all in the space of about two weeks. And I was in the mathematical jet set for a time. And that stopped me from worrying as to whether I was good enough. I sort of made a vow to myself. It was so nice not worrying anymore that I thought, I'm not going to worry anymore, ever again. I was going to study whatever I thought was interesting and not worry whether this was serious enough. Most of the time I've kept to that vow. And what has that resulted in for you? What has, has that made you better or more successful or just happier? What's the result of taking that attitude? Uh, well, it made me happier. Yes, it made me happier is the only one of those different things. You know, I sit in a corridor in the mathematics department in Princeton. And I think about things. I imagine that the young graduate students there think, oh, this guy's a loony, he did something good once. And I don't care, I really don't care. I've been released from worrying about what other people think about, about me. And in a way, he did do something interesting once. <laughs> you know, if I may say that. As far as I'm concerned, I'm doing something interesting right now. I don't mean talking to you. I'm sorry, that's really boring. <laughs> Forgive me for saying that. But um, 
Uh, no, I, I find some problem. I try and solve it. And I don't care whether it's a problem that will advance my reputation or not. I mean, I really don't. Do you care about advancing knowledge, advancing mathematics? Yes, I suppose I do, but less than I did before because, you know, I'm pretty old now. And uh, so if I advance mathematics and I'm not around to see the result of that advancement, then what do I care? Um, I don't know. I don't like thinking of my impending death. You know, I haven't got all that many years left. I don't quite know how many. But I do still like doing mathematical things, so I do. He was phenomenally fast. He could make calculations in his head very accurately and very quickly. You know, he had this system for telling the day of the week on which a given date had fallen. So he would say the 9th of March, 1564, and he would tell you instantly the day of the week. And he was right. I mean, he had a whole system for doing this. He practiced incessantly. His computer wouldn't let him log on until he had solved one of these puzzles. I asked him about checking his email, and this was in the mid-90s. He was already up to speed on email. But he said to me, you know, I can't get in. It takes me so long. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I, I make myself identify the day of the week for 10 random days of the week. I've programmed the computer to throw at me 10 random days of the year. In history, so it might say the 4th of July, 1827, and I have to type in a three if it's Tuesday or whatever, yeah. instantly. And I have to do 10 of these. And I said, how long does it take you? And he said, oh, I'm very slow these days. It's very embarrassing. Uh, it takes me about eight or nine seconds <laughs> right. to do 10 of them in a row. And the computer would lock him out if he didn't do it within 10 seconds flat. You know, at Cambridge, there was the John Horton Conway Appreciation Society. I think his students were always quite agog with him. You know, he would come in seeming to not know what he was doing and totally confused and disorganized. And then either by the end of the lecture, he would have pulled some rabbit out of a hat or by the end of the term, they would come to see that he, you know, had this sort of brilliant thread going all the way through. Yeah. So he was, and he was a sort of showman on various levels in that way. Like he really did sort of seem to be pulling at the strings and he had a, a grander idea in mind. So. Well, the first thing is it, it was nice when he actually showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and there were times at a couple of rather important national talks in the U.S. where he forgot to show up <laughs> in his later years. And that that was embarrassing because, you know, if you have 400 people in a room to see the great John Conway and he's not there and nobody even remembers having seen him at the meeting. <laughs> and it turns out that he'd forgotten to show up or had forgotten his plane ticket or whatever. That was not good. But on the occasions when he showed up, which was most of the time, in fairness, yeah. he was very unconventional. Uh, for instance, he came and talked to my students about 25 years ago, and I couldn't get him pinned down on what the topic was going to be, which had me a little worried. But but he said, don't worry, I've got various things I can speak about. So he walked into the room and he wrote up on the board about eight or nine topics, and he described them briefly and said to the students, which of these would you like to hear a talk on? <laughs> they, they were just flabbergasted because... That's not the way most of us, you know, you have to lecture, prepare very carefully and get your slides or, or your thoughts organized. And uh, they, they voted. Yeah. And democracy won. And he, he launched forth with great passion on, on one of them. And in fact, one of the talks he gave, he gave a few talks. One was on Can You Hear the Shape of a Drum, which he gave to an applied mathematics class, which was supposed to last for 50 minutes. And he went on for, I think, a little over two hours. Yeah. And it happened to, that there was an old class afterwards, so he didn't need the room. And the students didn't want to leave. They were just fascinated yeah. because he brought them into this deep result that uh, people had proven a few years earlier. And he had simplified the proof. It was one of his geniuses was for simplifying things, streamlining, making it seem obvious in hindsight. So he did it in such a way that these undergraduate students were with him all the way. And I, I just kept looking at my watch thinking they're going to bolt any minute. But they didn't. And they talked about him till they graduated. They still remember that visit. He had an office. I think at one point he had two offices, which just got overrun with stuff like models and papers and books and so forth. Um, at one point, his son Gareth strung hazard tape around his office because it was just such a tip. Yeah. And so I think partly it was it just became slightly inhabitable. So he would park himself in the common room. So there was there were windows lining the hallway and um, there were these nooks sort of one nook per window and there were two armchairs and a chalkboard. So along one wall, there was two armchairs facing a chalkboard 
on the other wall. So yeah. he sort of um, would always be in one of these alcoves. And, you know, even in, in Cambridge, he would spend a lot of time in the common room. So I think it must have been his just preferred modus operandi to sort of be out there and yeah. have people coming by him and, and talking. I didn't get the impression he was a super tidy man. No, no. I mean, in the alcove, there was his, under his, I think probably under a couple of different armchairs in various alcoves, he would stuff papers under the seat cushion. (laughs) So that's where he kept all his notes. Yeah. And then he would stash chalk in the radiators beside the, beside the window. So he always knew where some chalk was. So, you know, he... (laughs) He created a little ecosystem for himself. His work was was extremely deep and broad and extended over many decades, but was marked by this free spirited, fun loving and playful approach to everything, which which distinguished him from, you know, some other big shots who also did very serious mathematics. He had a flair and a passion, which was unique. But he, he did contribute to group theory, uh, coding theory, knot theory, geometry quadratic forms and two fields that he largely founded or played significant roles in founding. That would be cellular automata, I think the game of life, his most famous creation, mm. and combinatorial game theory. And sadly, within a year and a few days, we lost the three creators of combinatorial game theory, Elwin Berlekamp, a year ago, Richard Guy about a month ago, and now John a few days ago. So, um, you know, it's very much the passing of an era. He and Elwin were not friends at the end, I'm afraid. Uh, But their disagreement, which was passionate, was the kind that only mathematicians could possibly have. Namely, Conway thought that infinite games were important too, and Elwin only only thought that finite games were important. And this, they locked horns over this. And I think it, in some way, it, it stopped progress for a while on their big book. And at one point, Elwin threatened to sue Conway for non delivery of of the manuscript, so to speak. Um, it never well, came to that. Uh, well, I guess I, you know, simply came to see him as just being human. I can remember uh, one of the first times I visited him, I was staying with John and his wife, Diana, at their house. And I remember being horrified that he was eating Jello pops of <laughs> some kind. I'm like, oh my God, he's, he's, you know, he's a genius and he's eating jello pops. Like this can't be right. He must have, you know, some more sophisticated snack, which was, you know, silly, but, yeah. you know, just realizing that, yeah, he's just a guy and he likes jello pops. Um, <laughs> and in the end, you know, he has his foibles. He's definitely not perfect. Um, yeah. In the book, I, I say, you know, he's a sweetheart and an asshole. And he was fine with me saying that. So yeah, I just, you know, I just got to know him on a, a more granular level, if you will. And, you know, came to like him all the more, really. What When you say he was a bit of an asshole? I think it probably ran the spectrum. You know, he he had his moods. He could he could be a little, you know, there was maybe, although he was often insecure and self-deprecating, he could also be kind of hoity-toity. And, you know, maybe he didn't give everybody the attention they deserved, whether it's, you know, an interested student here and there or or his family and his life you know he was just yeah. he could be an asshole like anybody else can be an asshole he was once asked possibly in a an interview in a student magazine in recent years how he made progress on stuff and how he attacked difficult problems and and one of the things he said which actually resonated with me and i've kind of tried to take it on board is he said he never worked on a single problem at a time he always had you know five or six different pots simmering away hmm. And if he got stuck on one, he would switch gears and try another. And then he might be on the fourth one and he'd suddenly realize something from the second problem might help him or be relevant. So we said, don't be too narrow in your focus. You know, have broad interests, even within your discipline and have, be pursuing different theorems or lines of engagement or whatever. Yeah. And they might there might be some synergy between them. And he's a classic example of that. A lot of people have very narrow focuses, I think, in research. And, you know, it works for some people. And it may be the only thing that works for most of us. But when your mind is as original and effective as his was, and I, I can't begin to fathom how he how he functioned. Yeah, he made he made he made good use of you know multitasking and working on five different theorems at the same time. What was his crowning achievement in his mind? Do you think he was definitely proudest of the surreal numbers? Yeah, yeah, he really thought that was his greatest achievement. And I think he had hoped to sort of see them take on another life or find, find their way. And 
anybody I spoke to said they will eventually, you know, whether it's in physics or in another field. Yeah, he was he was definitely proudest of this real numbers. I think he also was still really curious about the monster group. And he wished that he understood why the monster group existed. And that was something he he was after he wanted to understand why before he died. And he would say, you know, I I fear I'm I'm not going to understand. Do you feel like he was happy with where he was towards the end? Like, was he satisfied? I think he was reasonably satisfied. I mean, I think just the nature of who he was, always wanting to understand things and and be curious, he was he was still wanting to do that. And I think at the end it was increasingly difficult and that frustrated him definitely. Yeah. You know, his brain was not working the way it used to and the way it want the way he wanted it to. I think that paint him but all in all I you know I visited him in in January and he still had his sense of humor and he was still you know making plays on words and talking about you know the game of life and he came to love life again which was nice to see that he came around to to love the game of life after hating it for so long <laughs> he, he made his peace with it did he I think he did yes finally I felt like Whenever, you know, my name was mentioned in respect of some mathematics, it was always the game of life. And I don't think the game of life was very, very interesting. I don't think it was worth all that. I've done lots of other mathematical things. So I found the game of life was sort of overshadowing much more important things, and I did not like it. Now, well, I'm getting old. Uh, my capacity for hatred is getting less, I suppose. And it was an achievement, and I'm quite proud of it. I just want to, don't want to talk about it all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Do you ever feel frustration that you won't see where things are going to be in 50 years or the next breakthrough? Do you, do you worry about the things you'll miss? Uh, no, I don't think I do. I mean, you see, a whole series of things have happened. You know, when I was... A kid, and I mean a sort of late teenager, and learnt about all these unsolved problems. It really did seem there, there were about four of them. There was the four-colour map theorem, there was Fermat's last theorem, the Riemann hypothesis, the continuum hypothesis, okay. Uh, and they had all lasted at least a hundred years. Um, and it, it looked as though they were going to last another few hundred years. <laughs> You know. Then they've mostly been solved, uh, in some sense. Continuum hypothesis, solved in a way. Four-colour map theorem, definitely solved. The human hypothesis, still unsolved. I've forgotten what the fourth one was. A Fermat solved, yes, of course. So three out of the four were solved, or should we say two and a half out of the four, because the solution of the continuum hypothesis is a bit different from the others, uh, but there's a very definite sense in which it is solved, and that may be the only sense in which one can live with it, so to speak. But they had all lasted at least a hundred years. Now, when something lasts a hundred years, you're unlikely to be at, in, in it at the beginning and at the end of it. <laughs> that demands that you're at least a hundred and, say, 17 years old, provided you're pretty bright at the age of 17. So essentially nobody is in at the beginning and the end. And so we're accustomed really in mathematics to have these problems that you don't expect to see solved in your lifetime. There's nothing you can do about that. I mean, you can wail and moan and say, you know, something. Uh, I've heard people say that uh, if they are granted the thing to come back in a few hundred years you know what's the first question you'd ask some of them say has the so-and-so problem been solved you know but uh, really there's nothing you can do you can try desperately to solve it but if it hasn't been solved for a hundred years you probably aren't going to you know it's only given to one person so to speak to solve a particular one of these problems so we're used to it and here's uh, an atmosphere of resignation you know there's also a thing that we don't really know quite often, whether a problem can be solved. Okay, that's that. I mean... I have to ask you then, if you, were to, if you come back in a few hundred years and get one question, what's your question then? Yeah, interesting. I, this is not original. I mean, uh, I'd like to know whether the agreement hypothesis has been solved and, and so on, and perhaps a few more 
technical details about it. Do you have unfinished business or are you... I don't know that I have. Uh, I mean, I have unfinished business in a way, things I'd like to do, but I'm not going to do them. I'm not going to solve them. There's one thing I would really like to know. Yes, perhaps if I hark back to the question you asked a little bit ago, there's a thing called the Monster Group, which is a beautiful, very large, symmetrical thing. <laughs> and I would just like to know what it's all about, you know, why it's there. I, I've often said, I've said for 25 or 30 years, that the one thing I'd really like to know before I die is why the Monster Group exists. I'm resigned now to not learning it before I die. I might just. Uh, every now and then I've taken it out, so to speak, thought about it for a time. It's about every five years. Uh, but usually when I've taken it out, dusted it and thought, thought about it for a time, I've made some progress. But I don't think I will learn what it's all about before I die. Well, he did leave us a great body of work. I mean, the, uh, the big group, Atlas and, you know, Game of Life, which people are still playing, and many other things, sphere packing and so on. But he, I think, you know, his, his, his originality, his original approach and spirit, I mean, there's very few people in the last 50 years, I can only think of one or two, who, who developed a following, if you like, almost a rock star-like following the way he did. I mean, the other obvious one would be the Hungarian itinerant mathematician Paul Erdős, who was about 20 years ahead of him. Erdős traveled the world and met people, and Conway did that too, in a different sense. But he did, you know, with 25 years in, in, in Britain, his home country, and another 25 or 30 in the States, he, um, he covered a lot of ground and met a lot of people and made a lot of friends and uh, had a heck of an influence. Erdős was a real character, a special, special person. Conway was a real character. I don't think I know anybody in that category who's alive today. He certainly added color to the scene anywhere he was in his shaggy way. Well, that's all from us today. I'll be putting plenty of links in today's show notes, including Siobhan's excellent biography of Conway. It's called Genius at Play. And also there among the links, I'll put all the videos we did with John Conway, including, of course, a couple about the game of life. There's also a lot of stuff there about the monster group and a look and say sequence that was a lot of fun too. I'm Brady Harron, and you've been listening to the Number File podcast. You can find out more about all our podcasts and videos at numberfile.com.